very new, but we do have an ambition. So that's good. Um, we launched at the end of October uh, last year, um, but um, and we ran up until Christmas, but then um, the restrictions um, since Christmas up here in Scotland um, has meant that um, our, our host, which is a, a school for um, young people with special needs, has meant that uh, we haven't been able to operate since Christmas, but we're looking into either an alternative site or, or hoping that that might change shortly. But I'll, I'll tell you about what happened last year. So um, first of all, who are we? Um, so it's all come from a community group that was formed in 2014 called the Mixing Bowl. Um, we are an unincorporated association um, and it was just a community food interest group trying to pull people together from the local area to do um, cooking workshops, which seem to be the most popular, but uh, talks, tastings, demonstrations, all sorts of things. And um, that is, well, until COVID was still ongoing and we'll, we'll return when we can. Um, in 2015, we were looking for a little bit of funding for some equipment that we needed, and we came across the Year of Food and Drink 2015, um, which there was a fund set up there for um, helping people to celebrate local food and drink. So sort of we just sort of just by accident fell into the thought that, well, why didn't we put on a, an event? Let's do a festival. And um, I remember sort of not really taking it very seriously to start with. And then as we started to, to think about it, we thought, yeah, this could be a very exciting idea. So um, 2015 was our first. We didn't really know what to expect. We said, okay, let's call it the Deeside Local Food Festival. We planned for around 500 people thinking that would be a, a nice event and that would, that would sort of do the job. But uh, when we had three times that number turn up, and um, embarrassingly, we couldn't quite feed everybody. <laughs> Most people got food, but not everybody. And it was a food festival. It was obvious that we couldn't leave it there. We had to continue. So five years on, we, um, 2019 was our last one. Um, we had 3,500 people turning up to the one day event. So that was very exciting. And um, we, we made a lot of friends uh, built lots of bridges with many producers and we've been totally in awe of, of what they've been up to. So, so that was a very exciting moment. Um, the last event that we had, we had over 70 food and drink businesses from the AB postcode, which is Aberdeen City and Shire. Um, and we, we based the activities, talks, tastings, demonstrations, workshops, as we did in the mixing bowl, but also we added farmer's market, we made a film of the producers and we had lots of kids activities supplied by local community groups. Um, so that set us up really well for 2020, so we thought, and we decided that we had outgrown our venue and we looked for a partner. And um, we were very excited when the National Trust for Scotland said that they would love us to come and run our event as part of a food and drink weekend that they were thinking of putting on and it was going to be something really quite amazing um but then of course that never came to anything with covid so maybe that's something we can pick up again in the future but uh, not for not for now but it did make us wonder all the way through because every single you know there was a lot of work that went into creating each day and each day that we had once a year we had sunshine and that in Scotland is quite unusual. So we were thinking, how could we make this festival more resilient? Um, and not realizing that COVID was around the corner and that was going to be our biggest challenge. So how could we make it more resilient? And um, I saw that the Soil Association was running the Building Local Food Hubs webinar back in July, 2020 um, and Nick, from Open Food Network was there and also Rosie from Bauhaus. So um, they gave a really good overview of um, the possibilities with Open Food Network. And I decided that surely this is something that we've got to explore further, um, but realized that we needed a base. And so that's the, but where question. So where could, where could we set this up? And in our 
relatively local area, it's, it's not that easy. Uh, we had explored a number of different options, but nothing really felt right, nothing really worked. Um, one of our, our producers, um, or rather one of our exhibitors at the festival happened to be the Camp Hill Estate, which is um, where the, the, the school um, for the special needs children that we are now hosted by, um, they, came, they came and they took a stall. Um, they were trying to show off a, a new concept that, that they had in mind. Um, and so I was talking to him one day and just mentioned that I was thinking of the food hub and he got extremely excited and he said, I'm sure we can find you a space. They have um, a, a farm there and the, you know, the, the estate's quite a large area. So we gratefully accepted their boiler cupboard, which, okay, it's not a cupboard. It, it, was, a, it was a room, but it was a boiler room. Um, and that was where we operated the hub from um, and then moved all uh, boxes of customer orders down to a shed where people picked up from. And that worked fine. Um, but obviously I needed to work out who, who I was gonna take on this journey with me and with the mixing bowl and the festival um, already behind us, there were a lot of people that I could call on, which was great. So we've got a nice little team. Um, when, so, we weren't sure whether we were going to start with a weekly event or a fortnightly event or a monthly event. You know, going for once a year to suddenly weekly seemed like a big uh, jump. So we decided we'd go for fortnightly. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. And then how? Um, so like I said, um, Nick was a great help to start with. And then I plugged into his uh, Thursday morning sessions and that was very helpful. And then Al from Helston Food Hub kindly shared some of his um, documents that he had put together and that gave me a head start on procedures and um, yeah, and uh, risk assessments and things. So that was really helpful. And we started to run what we called a trial, which was four order cycles. Um, and over that time, we ended up with 160 unique customers um, and 140 products. So it felt like we were on a on a good track ready to get back into it after Christmas. But what did we learn from the trial? So I must admit, I think you admitted it the other day, Kay, um, I must admit that I am a, a bit of a perfectionist. And so I was trying to get everything crossed and ticked before uh, we we started. But I think my probably my biggest uh, take home from the trial was it was needed to just give it a go and then adjust from there onwards. Um, we were very well received, which was great. Lots of enthusiasm from the community. Um, but something that did surprise me was the, the order values. And I just had it in my head, in my, my conservative cash flow um, um, forecast. I was imagining that it was going to be something like 20 to 30 pounds per customer. Um, but I think on average, we were more like 40 to 50 pounds, which was a, a great help for us getting started. Um, and then, yeah, we had, so one of, one of the things that I thought was going to work that didn't, um, we had our chilled produce arrive we sorted it into, um, into bags per customer. The bags were the compostable, so people can use them to put their food waste in once they empty the bag. And then we put that into a large cooler um, because we didn't have any fridge or freezer um, in, in the boiler room. Um, but it soon became apparent that the number of times we had to access this, this cooler with all the, the customer orders, it wasn't cool at all because the, the, wind, the the lid was opening constantly. So we decided we need to split the, the cool boxes into small cool, cool boxes. And um, being up here in Aberdeen with the, the fish industry so close by, we have a, a, a polystyrene uh, box producer. And um, although I'm not, I'm not uh, particularly keen on using polystyrene, as long as I'm reusing it many times over, then uh, it felt like it was our solution for now. Um, so contacted the, the producer and they very kindly even donated 50 boxes um, to us, which was really great. Um, 
another learning lesson we had was that when the, the products arrived, the two extra people that were helping, um, I sort of split the workload into those that, so one person was, was sorting the orders for pickup and one person was sorting the orders for delivery, but soon realized that that wasn't really making any help at all. And it was much better to split it by ambient versus chilled. So we ended up in the end with one person working inside and then the chilled person was working outside. Um, and, and that was a much better split. We also learned a lot from our survey, which we, we put out at the end of the trial. Um, one of the things that came back was that customers would be very happy to pick up for neighbors. So that allows for a future um, request. You know, as people are picking up, we can maybe give them some flyers and they can maybe put them around their, their neighborhood um, and, and even offer that, that they could do the, the pickup and bring, you know, do a little um, delivery to them there. Um, there was also a strong emphasis on people wanting to do something around food poverty, um, also around food waste. Um, we haven't yet defined how we're going to address these, but it's certainly something for the coming year. And I also needed to check uh, whether weekly, fortnightly or monthly was the best option. And uh, so we actually had exactly a split of a third of the people said they'd like it weekly, a third fortnightly and a third monthly. So by, by running it month, fortnightly just now seems to be a good compromise. So I want to say a little bit more about um, the, the school because it does feel like it's, it's a partnership it's yet to grow into a stronger relationship, but um, definitely there's, there's good potential there. So because it's a, a residential school, then um, they have their own, um, like a wholesale distribution area and they call it Fruva. So they have producers coming in and then they split it into the various houses that, that the food needs to go to. So it's quite interesting that although we are completely different, we're also quite similar in nature. And it's, it's the Fruva part of Camp Hill that, that, have, been our, um, that have, have been our partner. Um, they also were able to offer a venue free of charge, which as a completely new startup, that was, that was really helpful. And, um, and because of their logistics on site for their Fruva operation, they have a lot of plastic crates that they move the food around in and we were able to, to use that. So that, that was also a great help. They have a, a, a really good understanding of our hub and of what we're trying to do. And they're also very keen to engage with the local community and they see that the mixing bowl um, group is, is their link between the community and, and themselves. So we're, we're, we're helping each other. And what's really exciting is that Camp Hill School is part of the Camp Hill Wellbeing Trust. And the Camp Hill Wellbeing Trust are currently running a project called Compass, where they are wanting to repurpose a, an, another, another school that is in the same area. Um, and they're wanting to create it into a sustainability and healthy wellbeing center for the community and that they see um, the Deeside Food Hub as a critical part for that. So we've, we've really got someone championing us from the side here, cheering for us, um, which is wonderful because it really makes it feel like we've got purpose and we've got, um, we've got a, a direction. So where are we today? Well, like I mentioned, COVID hasn't been on our side, but um, we are looking to address that hopefully um, be back up and running in March. We've also had quite a, a swap around. So the person that was doing our, our deliveries and also was supplying some, um, some food as well um, has taken on a new enterprise themselves, which means that they're temporarily out of action for us. So I put a, an advert out looking for other delivery drivers and um, volunteer drivers. And we've got four people that have come back, which means we've got a really nice little team now, which means it won't be a, a huge job for any one person and someone can just take it to the various areas in our, in our catchment area. Um, we've got some new producers being added as well, which is what I've been busy with recently. 
and um, we've got a new location within Camp Hill. So we've been upgraded from the boiler room and we're now going to the tatty shed. <laughs> so, so we're going to be part of the farm, which is also great. Um, and it gives us more space, which is really what we needed. Um, and so we're, we're looking forward to that. But while we've been um, offline, if you like, then it's been really fantastic to dip into the OFN webinars, to have Kay's super support on the social media side and also to um, integrate into the MailChimp. So that lines us up. So we're, we're ready to go. So just aspirations for the coming year. Obviously, sending our customers. Super sorry to interrupt, just a quick note, we've probably got about a minute left. This is the last slide, I promise you. <laughs> um, so obviously expanding our customer base, moving into hopefully the new community hall that's part of the, um, the, the Compass project. Um, and part of that, Camp Hill are wanting for their school residents to have moments where they can come and help us with the food hub as part of a, a meaningful work experience um, for the children. Um, we're also hoping that we can maybe dip back into our events idea and run a number of small ones, maybe next year. Um, and like I said, there's food poverty and food waste. Um, and if, if all goes well, then we would like to maybe formalize our, our structure a little bit, but maybe this time next year. And maybe the year after we'll be as big as Cambridge. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks so much for your share. And one thing that just kept coming up a lot was just how much you've kind of, yeah, show the power of community in what you're doing and just talking to the people in your community and getting support from all of these different places. So, yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, and yeah, that was a really, yeah, really, really awesome story to hear thank you. Uh, from, from then until now. <laughs>